hour two tonight, we're going to talk to Herbert Dorsey again. A lot of email from folks about Herbert Dorsey, who is one of the most well-read and knowledgeable people on the eclectic, esoteric side of life and what's really going on than you'll ever want to hear. He's uh, coming to us from the islands out there in the Pacific. Hello, Herbert. Welcome back to the program. Thanks so much for being here again. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Good. Now, you have, of course, as we have mentioned, uh, a number of fascinating books. And if you just click on Herbert's name or look below it, you'll find out uh, what we're talking about. The Secret History of the New World Order, Secret Science and the Secret Space Program, and and on and on. We've talked about a number of of subjects. Tonight we're going to talk about very, very advanced, we could call it black ops, I guess, uh, scientific achievements and science. And uh, by the way, Herbert's newest book, The Covert Colonization of Our Solar System, uh, is a a must-read. They all are. So tell us what we're going to survey tonight. And let's jump in. Okay, well, um, I remember last uh, time we had a talk, um, we were talking about free energy and how uh, Dennis Lee had was able to generate yeah. uh, electricity from In the Ventura. air. Ventura, yeah. Right. And uh, so I wanted to take that concept a little further. Uh, you know, we're talking about it, you know, the air molecules at that standard temperature and pressure are moving about 700 miles an hour, and so that's a lot of kinetic energy there. But because it's hmm. random, uh, it, it's, it's, there's no 700 mile an hour wind blowing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, you can cap this energy with with uh, because it creates temperature and pressure, and densely successfully did that. Well, uh, if we take that concept and reconsider the, the the idea that ether actually does exist and empty space really isn't empty. Uh, the average ether molecule or particle is much smaller than a molecule. It's, it'd be a very small particle, but it's moving. Are they, are they, sub, are they subatomic? Oh, most definitely. Much okay. smaller than an electron, even. I just want to get that clear for folks. So there, there are, in space, it's not empty. Uh, space, no. according to Herbert's research, is full of uh, energy, items, smaller than an atom, smaller, he suggests, than an electron. That's the ether. Go ahead. Okay, so the average ether velocity, uh, instead of 700 miles an hour, it's uh, three times 10 to the 8 meters a second. That's all, huh? <laughs> That's the speed of light. Okay. Wow. So anyway... Uh, if there was some way to tap the energy of the ether, uh, it would be uh, far more uh, energy available than what's in the air at standard uh, pressure and temperature. Uh-huh. So um, the problem is that ether goes through all matter. You can't contain it. You can't compress it. You know, it, it goes right through steel like it wasn't even there. It's so small that it goes right through any kind of matter. So how do you contain the ether? Well, um, Nikola Tesla suspected and and experimented around that you can actually do it electromagnetically. That's the way you get a hold on the ether and try to use it for your own purposes. Okay, so um, one of the things I, I also talked about, he was using pulsating direct current instead of alternating current. In his more uh, in his later experiments, and when he pulsated this this very high voltage, maybe ten thousand volts, uh, and he pulsated it uh, by using a a uh, rotating switch that would interrupt and go on and off, and he could do it like at ten kilocycles around that area. Um, he found out that if he sent this kind of direct current, pulsating direct current down a wire that uh, there was all kind of interesting phenomena that went with it. And he deduced that what he was doing was creating an ether wind. And uh, so he uh, did special kind of coils using this pulsating DC. And uh, some of them were conical shaped and some of them were pancake coils. And um, he was able to actually magnify energy using these things. 
Huh. A lot of people, a lot of engineers would be very skeptical of that statement because they've been taught that you can't magnify energy. Or this thing called the conservation of energy, right? So, Her- well, excuse uh, me, Herbert, let me ask a question. Yeah. Was yeah. Was Tesla able to influence the direction of the etheric particles or just the uh, the mass and its random chaotic flow? No, he was actually able to, to uh, make the ether flow in a specific direction. Usually it was down a wire. The wire acted like a channel, but the en- actually energy wasn't in the wire. It was around the outside of the wire. Ah, wow. But the wire would direct the flow. Okay. And uh, it was almost like a fluid flow, according to his own experiments. A really good book for people who want to learn about this is by Gary Velocitos. It's called uh, Lost Science, is one of his books. Yeah. And the other one is called The Secret Weapons of the Cold War. And um, anyway, so that's where you learn a lot of details about that, so I'm not going to get into it real real in-depth. Oh, Velocitos uh, is a, a very underrated uh, writer who was, I guess, kind of at his his uh, apex 20 years ago. Uh, people knew him more then. They don't know him much now anymore. Well, the, the truth is ageless. <laughs> it doesn't matter when it was come oh, oh, absolutely. What matters is that it is brought up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the conservation of uh, the thermodynamic uh, second law, which says that energy is conserved, and most people use that to de- debunk any claims of free energy machines. Well, that a rule is true as long as you have a totally isolated system. The only problem is, as Thomas Bearden and many others have pointed out, is there is no such thing as a totally isolated system. Uh, usually, uh, There's all kinds of magnetic electric fields and other types of fields, gravitational fields, that penetrate the object. And one really big uh, source of of energy is the flux of neutrinos. The neutrinos uh, at the surface of the Earth are 66 billion neutrinos per second per square centimeter. So there's a lot of neutrino energy flowing through, and they penetrate everything, steel walls, uh, cylinders, anything like that. They're going through it all. And so if if somebody could figure out a way to tap the neutrino energy, (laughs) they'd have a heck of a source of energy. Yeah. So anyway, uh, there there was one professor who claimed to have done that. His name was Dr. Konstantinin Mile. He's located in, in Europe. And he's written a number of books in German, but you can also get some translated into English. So if you just put that, Dr. K-O-N-S-T-A-N-I-N-M-E-Y-L into a Google search engine, you'll find his websites and information about his series. Okay. His, his, his primary theory was the potential vortex. Um, and he, he says this solves a lot of the problems at the atomic level and unifies and creates a lot more uh, coherent theory of, of how atomic matter works and everything. But anyway, he said that in his flat pancake coil, similar to what Tesla was using, the neutrinos become unwound and turn into electrons and become current carriers. And he was able to magnify energy, and he even sells little kits. He's a professor. He, he teaches his theories to all his students, and they do experiments. And he's proven that, yeah, you get more energy out than you put in with these kits that he has. So he's well worth checking out on the Internet. But anyway, uh, some of the other issues I wanted to get into. Uh, and uh, electromagnetism, well, maybe I should I start with more simple stuff. Or, well, I like I the idea of what you did already was uh, explaining the ether, uh, that these are everywhere, apparently in the universe. Wherever there seems to be space, there really isn't. Right. <laughs> There's, it's a venue for lots of particulate activity. But these particulates are subatomic, and even you're suggesting sub-electron in size. What oh, would you yeah, what would you smaller. what would you call these etheric particles? Does anyone name them? It just call it when ether and down, yeah? Okay, uh, let me point out a few things. Now, quantum physicists 
I developed a fairly um, good theory uh, using quantum mechanics. And there's there's three things that uh, that he come up with. It's called the Planck length, which is the smallest quanta of length. And there's the Planck time, which is the smallest quantum of time. And then there's another thing called the Planck mass, which is the smallest quantum of mass. I cannot prove it, but I'm suggesting that these etheric particles may be the, of the amount of mass of the Planck mass, which would be extremely small. Okay, I mean, I'm, that's just my own suggestion. I don't really, I can't really prove it at this point. Um, but anyway, um, so there are, space is real grainy. It's not continuous. It's, it's, it's quantized. This is what the quantum physicists have come up with. But anyway, uh, getting back to um, some other ideas for uh, people who have a little mechanical understanding. Um, what if you took a pendulum and you put it on a seesaw? You got a pendulum that's on one side of a seesaw, and on the other side you have a piston. The seesaw is attached to a piston. Now when you swing that pendulum back and forth, at the lowest part of the swing, it exerts a lot more force uh, than it does at the upper part of the swing. Okay. Now that's because it's the combined weight of the pendulum plus the centrifugal force of the pendulum. At the top part of the swing, the, the, the centrifugal force drops to zero because there's no velocity. So anyway, uh, there's been an experimenter that did something like this. He, and he swung the pendulum back and forth, and the other side of the seesaw is pumping up and down and, and running a water pump with it. Well, it turns out the amount of energy pumping the water is much greater than the amount of energy it takes to keep the pendulum swinging because <laughs> it's only limited by air resistance and, hmm. and maybe the fulcrum resistance. So there's a real simple mechanical gadget that can actually multiply energy. And it's been proven. The guy's done experiments. He's got his own website and all, all that. So I, mean, I just wanted to show that it is possible with a real simple mechanical device uh -huh. to multiply energy. Huh. But now I want to get into electronics for some of the people who are more familiar with electromagnetics and all. Um, we have three types of electromagnetic waves. In the engineering classes I was in, I only taught about one of them. And that's the transverse electromagnetic wave. But there's two other types of wave, and one of them is called the longitudinal wave. And the way you make longitudinal electromagnetic waves are using a special geometry of antennas. So with a flat plate antenna, all the electric vectors are radiating straight out from the plate and in both directions, of course. Uh, so then when you oscillate this thing, the electric vectors are either going away from the plate or into the plate. There's no um, way that, there, that you can get a magnetic field out of, out of the oscillating electric field, except on, on the borders of the plate, on the, on the edges of the plate. You can get a small amount of um, magnetic field. So at that point, you have not an electromagnetic wave, you have an electrogravitic wave. Mm -hmm. it, it oscillates between the gravity field and the electric field, right. not between the electric field and the magnetic field. Okay? Now, a lot of people say, oh, how can you prove that, or how could that possibly be? And I'll just say that um, in my last book, I developed a mathematical formula that shows that gravity, the gravitational potential is merely the divergence of the electro, uh, uh, electric potential vector, which is designated as A in your engineering books. The A vector, the quantum physicists have shown, is much more fundamental than the electric or the magnetic field. The vector potential, magnetic vector potential field is used in quantum mechanics as the primordial field and the electric and magnetic fields are simply effects of the magnetic vector potential. So anyway, um, and um, there's well known among electrical engineers that the E field is equal to the, 
the negative partial derivative of the a vector uh, in respect to the t, uh, partial derivative of the t vector. So that's how it turns out it's an electrogravitational wave instead of an electromagnetic wave. Uh, another kind of antenna is a spherical antenna. All the e vectors are going radially away from the center of the sphere and all the magnetic fields that would have been generated by the oscillating E fields are now canceling each other out. So it's just, it's even more efficient at eliminating the magnetic effects than the flat plate antenna. So here's how you generate longitudinal waves. Now the interesting thing about longitudinal waves, they can penetrate conducting matter. So submarines under the ocean can use longitudinal waves to right. communicate with each other. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to get into scalar waves. These are even more exotic. <laughs> now, they, okay. Now here's an area that a lot of people say. Well, everyone talks about scalar this and scalar that. Nobody really understands it. Nobody can prove it. It's not been proven. That's it's, not true. it's it's pure. I'm telling you what you what you, what you hear out there that it's purely okay. speculative. This is the common criticism of it. So let's put for once and for all on the table the reality of this thing. Go ahead. Well, I won't be the first to put the reality on the table. I give the credit to Thomas Bearden. Well, Tom, I know Tom for a long time, and I, I haven't been able to get him on the air because he he, he just he's doesn't do radio. Him. That what's that? Yeah, he's he's getting pretty old now. Well, he, he even years ago he said, I, "Jeff, I just can't do it." I've been. He was warned. Yeah. All right, let's leave it at that. Yeah. He knew too much. Oh, I got it. Okay. Well, I'm not afraid of him. Yeah. So I'm going to go and tell it like it is. All right. Um, Okay, now, according to Thomas Bearden, and he's written a lot of good books about this stuff, and I'm a student of his. Yeah. Um, scalar waves are made by combining two uh, regular electromagnetic waves 180 degrees out of phase. So, in other words, uh, in electrical engineering, if you brought two these waves that were 180 degrees out of phase, which means the wave fronts are opposing each other, basically, uh, the one, one wave has the positive maximum while the other wave has the negative max, maximum. That's 180 degrees out of phase. Well, in electrical engineering, you say, oh, those two waves cancel each other, and there's nothing left. Okay, that's standard theory. Thomas Bearden says, no, wait a minute. Uh, there's a pressure wave. It's just like if you got two elephants pushing against each other. Right. There's a pressure between them. <laughs> they don't cancel. Their forces don't cancel out, and they're ignoring the pressure wave. Well, that's the scalar wave. Now, what's interesting about the scalar wave well, is that it doesn't have any extension in space. It only exists in the time axis. This is according to Thomas Bearden. Okay, now, so that means that since every instant of time in the whole universe is the same instant that these scalar waves can be transmitted instantaneously doesn't matter how far away the, the signal will arrive, this, arrive at the same instant that you transmit it so they're instantaneous that's right. the first exotic thing okay. about scalar waves um, the next interesting thing and Thomas Bearden has suggested this and uh, other people experimentally discovered this that these scalar waves can affect time they affect time itself 